It's well established that Earth shares our solar system with many other worlds. But what do we know about what it's like on these faraway celestial bodies? From Io's incredible volcanism to the inhospitable environment on Venus, things can get pretty extreme when you leave Earth. Now a new series called Solar System is bringing the planets and their moons as well as dwarf planets to us as we get a glimpse of what it might be like to walk on their surface or fly through their atmospheres. We spoke to series producer Gideon Bradshaw and Alice Jones to find out more about the science that inspired the series and the extreme environments to be found in our solar system. Gideon and Alice, welcome. Please, could you introduce yourself and your new series? Do you want to start? Um, I'm Alice Jones. I'm a series producer on Solar System. I think what's exciting is we've got the opportunity to take people on an adventure across the solar system to sort of see what it would be like to set foot on some of these amazing worlds that are out there um, and experience what's happening and the activity um, across the solar system. And I'm Gideon Bradshaw, I'm the exec producer on the series. Um, I was fortunate enough to have made a series not too long ago called The Planets. Um, and what's great about Solar System is just seeing you know, how much we've learned in that. I think it was like five years ago, roughly, that series came out. So what's been great is just to report, I guess, on, on all the latest, very latest discoveries about the, the solar system around us. There have been a lot of new discoveries thanks to space probes. The volcanoes on Venus, the plumes of Enceladus, so many. What have been some of your favorite environments uh, you explore in the Solar System series? So, I mean, you're absolutely right. What's incredible is there's now about, we, we think by our count, almost 40 active probes around the solar system. We've got space telescopes as well, you know, the, the order of 30 of those up there. Um, and those are showing, you know, this, just this remarkable new sort of set of data that we have um, right across the solar system. So from Venus, as you've already mentioned, way out beyond Pluto, you know, even further out. And all of these objects are sort of featured in this new series. Um, in terms of, you know, stuff that I didn't know, I've made a few of these shows and, and new to me on this series, that the Spitzer Space Telescope discovered perhaps one of the largest objects in the entire solar system, which is actually a, a very dark ring system, um, which uh, you know extends this tremendous sort of uh, it's around um, Saturn, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a huge, <laughs> huge dark ring, ring, way out beyond the um, inner rings of Saturn. That we're That's used right. To so the stuff that you're familiar with and seeing, you know, the Spitzer Space Tel Telescope, which sees in infrared has been able to pick out this enormous object that stretches, you know, far bigger than we ever imagined. And it plays a really interesting role in another character in, we call them characters, because we, we believe them <laughs> as little, you know, we kind of anthropomorphize the, the planets and moons a bit in this series between us. Maybe not in the show, but you can't help. They're cute. They've got character, right? And there's a moon um, around Saturn um, called Iapetus um, that is one of the weirdest objects in the solar system, because one side of it is completely white and the other side is completely dark. Um, so you've got to think, why? What is going on there? Um, and I won't tell you the whole story because you've got to watch the, the show, but that ring has a, a role to play in it. And the formation of that ring is also fascinating and that involves yet another mean called Phoebe. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that's just one example of, you know, some of the stuff that we're only really just beginning to understand and tease apart about the, all the complex sort of dynamics in the solar system. And it's thanks to, as I say, all these amazing missions. Yeah, and um, I think the Juno probe, NASA's Juno probe, um, has given us a really interesting new view of um, Jupiter's moon Io. It's a tiny moon, about the, well, tiny, about the same size as our moon, I think, and, um, but it's the most extreme place um, I'd never imagined. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's sort of coated in this yellow frost of um, sulfurous crystals, um, which have come out of all of the volcanoes that are across its surface. It's, it's, um, it's one of the most, well, it's the most vol volcanically active world in the solar system. And it's got, when you see it through Juno's infrared eyes, you can see these hot spots of volcanism all over it. So it's erupting up there right now. Um, and it's orbiting um, Jupiter. It's one of the four Galilean moons and you can see it um, with a telescope. So it's, it's something that Galileo spotted in the very early days um, 
and we've just got this amazing new view of it and it's much more active, much more sort of alive than we um, could ever have imagined really. And that's in the series, it was, it was incredible actually, we'd, we'd actually sort of shot the story, interviewed the scientists, um, we're editing that where we realised that actually Juno is going to make its closest ever approach to IO um, and those images came back and actually are featured in the, in the, in the series. So. We won't be that close again for some time because now um, yeah. uh, little Juno is uh, you know, getting further and further away again and I forget exactly how many years it's got left but it's definitely towards the end of mission. Venus is notoriously inhospitable and past probes haven't exactly lasted very long. So what was the motivation behind including Venus in the series and how did you manage to make it look so great? So, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, Venus is, is a difficult planet, as you've, you've hinted at. I mean, you know, from Earth, it's this, one of the brightest objects you can see in the sky because of these clouds that engulf the whole thing, which means you can't see the surface, right? So you're, you're absolutely right. That's a real challenge for a, a visual medium. You know, how on Earth are we going to reveal what's going on on the surface? Um, so we knew we wanted to do that from the get-go. Um, and it did take quite a while to find the story and the right approach. So in the episode that you're talking about, it's our opening episode, it's all about the volcano worlds of the solar system. And the way we kind of solved it in the end is that during lockdown, um, there was some new work done on old data. So, you know, we've already talked about brand new data coming in, but what's interesting is these data sets, scientists pour over them for years afterwards. Um, and, and yeah, there was, uh, I mean, Alice, perhaps you tell the story, there yeah. was an amazing story happened while we were making Yeah, so it's obviously it's coated with clouds, so you can't see the surface with your eyes, but um, using radar, you can peer, scientists have been able to peer down to the surface, and the Magellan um, probe, which I think is from the 80s, um, sort of has mapped the surface, and that's what revealed um, Venus to be, to have probably the most volcanoes of any world in the solar system. It's up there with Earth, um, but uh, they're littered all across the surface, and it's a, an ex a completely extraordinary place. But there's no proof, or there was no proof, as, as to whether any of these volcanoes were active or not. And in the very early days, as we were developing the program, we spoke to some scientists, um, including um, David Grinspoon, who ha has worked closely with NASA and is obsessed with Venus. And he, uh, we were a bit like down on Venus because it looks a bit gravelly and a bit like a car park. And he was like, it's the most amazing place. And we're pretty sure um, that there are active volcanoes today. And we were like, but it hasn't been proved. And he was like, oh, you know, I just watched this space. And during lockdown, a, a scientist, uh, Robert Herrick, who's, I think, um, based in a university in Alaska, was, I think he was quite bored in Zoom meetings. And so he sort of checked out, you know, maybe went on, <laughs> turned off his video and started looking at this old data and comparing uh, information and analysing it and he spotted that there was this particular area that over a time period had showed change um, which looked like a big lava lake and they examined it and, and found the first evidence for active volcanism on Venus and since actually making the programme I think more data has revealed more volcanoes are active and it wouldn't be surprising if beneath that, that thick cloud layer um, there's a really active dynamic world there but it's the surface is incredible and it's as hot, it's so hot down there that it would melt lead. So it's really, really, really difficult to, spend, to send a probe to the surface. Um, so it's amazing what these sort of exterior eyes in radar can, has, has revealed. There are certainly several characters in the solar system. Is there one celestial body that has a special place in your heart? Well, we're very lucky, aren't we, in this series? So, I mean, there are so many. I mean, just to... It's a bit of a blatant sell, forgive me, but you know, there are, every episode we, we have something between six or seven different stories. So we cover an awful lot of ground in the series. It's, you're not just going to get the planets, you're going to get the moons, asteroids, comets, are all part of the solar system ultimately. Yeah, we cover some extraordinary objects. Dwarf There's, planets. Dwarf planets, I forgot the dwarves. <laughs> yeah, so we've got, um, you know, places like Ceres, a dwarf planet, um, where we tell you a really fascinating little story about some discoveries that were made. I think it was the Dawn probe went out there and um, discovered um, some interesting surface um, uh, features which feature in the series, um, which then lead to some quite profound discoveries. So 
that's one. Um, we've got an egg-shaped, another dwarf planet, an egg-shaped one called Haumea. I hope I've said that right. Haumea. 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 Um, <laughs> which, uh, again, is just the most bizarre object um, in the solar system. It's um, an egg shape with a ring oh, and yeah. two moons around it. And it just seems completely bizarre and it spins incredible. Well, I shouldn't, I, I, I don't want to tell you all the secrets. Yeah. You've got to watch the show, but it spins to incredibly fast. But yeah, the question is, why does it look like that, yeah. right? You know, well, and that's the sort so of narrative weird. hook that, that we unpick. And that lives really, really far out at the very edge of sort of what we, well, not at the edge of the whole solar system, but at the very far reaches in the Kuiper Belt. Um, and that's a really cool place, isn't mm. it? The Kuiper Belt. There's lots of stuff hiding though? there. Well, I quite like. I quite like. There's. We don't really go there, but there's one that's got a great name, Gong Gong. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Arakoth, which is oh, yeah. a weird. Sounds like Marvel. <laughs> yeah, Arakoth has got like <clears throat> a head attached to it, and it's this sort of strange um, alliance of two bodies that have sort of um, come together. I really like Iapetus. It's a good I story. love Iapetus yeah. and Phoebe. Good story. There's my, a lot. <laughs> my favourite would be um, Miranda. Um, so that's another moon um, that I've been trying to get into one of these series for years, and we managed to do it on this one. Um, and the reason why um, I like that so much is that there's probably the largest cliff in the entire solar system is on that moon. And it's a very small moon, so it's got this enormous feature. If you look at it from space, it, it, people call it like the Frankenstein moon as well. It looks like it's just been squished together. So it's got these really weird surface features that you just look at it going, what on earth is going on there? But the reason I like it is because it's so small, that giant cliff, if you were to sort of jump off it, um, you know, the gravity's much weaker. So on earth it would take something like, I don't know, I forget it's how like high five it is, it's seconds, huge, I isn't think. it? It's like yeah. every sort of scale from it's memory. A massive cliff. Absolutely yeah. massive cliff. If you were on Earth, you'd sort of fall down it in about, you know, a minute. But out there, it'd be like 10, 15 minutes with a weak gravity. So you could sort of read a paper on the way down. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's an idea of, um, you know, just stepping off that cliff and, and probably surviving at the bottom as well. <laughs> and also one of the, one of my favourite places, which, um, it, 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 it's around Saturn, it's called Pan, oh, and yeah. it looks a bit like, some people describe it as like a ravioli or an empanada or a UFO. It's got this ridge all around it, and it's this tiny little moon that sort of lives within the rings and sort of sucks up a lot of the ring material, and it's got this ridge. It's, it's just, it's crazy to imagine that it exists, and I can't imagine what it would be like to sort of to land on it and yeah. stand on its surface. I mean, what a weird place. And it's there. With you know, the rings all around there. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the series wouldn't be complete without mention of the search for life. Why was it important for you to include that? And was there anywhere in particular you wanted to explore? Well, I think it's one of the number one miss missions of NASA, really, the exploration of our solar system in the search for life beyond Earth. Um, and it, it's, it comes up in two of our episodes, um, Volcano Worlds, the first, the opening episode, um, which explores active geology and um, you, you need energy and you need chemistry um, and, and water to, to get life. So if we, the, the fact that there are so many active worlds out there in the solar system is not only surprising, but it also gives a lot of hope for finding um, potentially um, life out there. Um, and then we also explore this in, in our episode Ice Worlds, um, where we um, have a story about the moon Europa. Do you want to talk more about yeah, Europa? Yeah, so Europa is the other candidate. Um, and you know, what we understand about life is that it, it needs water as far as we can tell. You know, there are these sort of certain ingredients. You've mentioned the energy, it needs water. Um, so, you know, NASA have this other term, which is follow the water, you know. So you look for where in the solar system there are these bodies of water where life may have got going. Um, so Europa has got this, this subsurface ocean of water. Um, and therefore we think it's probably got enough energy you know how's that water being kept liquid so there's probably some sort of energy source under that ocean um, and then as we tell in that story it's quite elaborate story this so i can't go into all the detail you have to watch the show again but um, let's just say um, that io that volcanic um, moon um, also has a part to play in feeding the chemistry that that world needs you put all that together and you've got all the ingredients that we think life needs Mm -hmm. So then the question is, is it there? And, you know, is there something therefore unique about this rock? 
or are these other rocks in the solar system going to give us hints or clues as to whether life is an inevitability from geology, whether ge geology can become biology, or is there something really special and unique going on here? All of which points to, you know, are we ultimately alone in the universe? One of these mm. biggest questions you can ask, really. And that's why the solar system's great, because, yeah. you know, we're never going to go to distant stars. We might get biosignatures, but we're never going to travel there. Whereas we literally are traveling to these other worlds in the solar system, and, and there are missions planned to go and answer some of these huge questions. Yeah, so Europa, um, when we were f uh, <laughs> developing that story, um, we worked closely with some NASA scientists who work on the um, Europa Clipper mission, and we feature several of them in the, in the, in the series. Um, uh, one of the um, scientists, Sam Howell, came with us on location, and he's working on the Europa Clipper mission, which is launching this, later this year. Um, and he's also working on future missions where they hope to actually land on the, on the surface of Europa and potentially deploy robotic um, instruments that would m melt through the ice. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, really, um, that they're going to be landing on, that, well, they're hoping to land on the surface of these ice worlds. But what's great is that they're made of ice. So it's actually, if you can heat something up, it's actually quite easy, well, easy to get into them. You just need Only to melt, melt your way down 20 <laughs> kilometres of rock solid ice. And then, and then, then we're there. <laughs> then we might get the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. I'd like to conclude by asking, what do you hope the audience takes from Solar System? Uh, I hope I, I hope people feel the the wonder of what is out there. It is the most extraordinary neighbourhood um, that we have, you know, orbiting the sun. Um, it's much more diverse. It's much more active um, than we could ever imagine. And there's so much more to discover. It hasn't all been worked out. So I hope that it'll inspire the future future generations to go and work at places like NASA or at universities or ESA and other international space agencies and really, really go out there and actually explore. Yeah, I, I'd second that. It's like it's the frontier, you know, of, of not physically it's our frontier and it's like the knowledge frontier as well. And I think um, I would hope the same. I mean, I, I've made a few of these series now over time and what's fascinating is like we just talked about Clipper. So um, Europa Clipper, you know, if it launches in October successfully, which we all crossing everything it will. I think it's still six or seven years until that gets there, right? So we're sort of talking 20, so we'll have to get another series up and running when, <laughs> when it gets there. Because, you know, again, we'll learn new things at that point. Um, so I think it, it's it hopefully inspiring that, that, you know, that people can be involved in, that you can follow this through your lives as we learn more about some of the biggest, um, you know, concepts, as we said, and questions that humanity can ask. So, and I think just one additional to that is that I was just talking to my kids the other day and just saying that actually it's one of those moments where you reflect on where things are and, you know, we are gonna see people going back to the moon very soon. So, and, and we may even see, certainly in their lifetimes, you know, we may see people getting to Mars. Um, and that is going to be mind blowing. <laughs> so um, you know, in our own little way, I can I, you know I hope that we you Ooh. know igniting all those fires and just helping people understand that it's not just the adventure; it's you know the deep profundity of all this stuff as well, which um, hopefully we do our bit to hook people into.